Right, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, that long list of CV, I've just been accused on my table of not being nearly old enough to have achieved uh, all of those things. So um, uh, I, am, I am indeed a fake, I'm here to announce that. Um, it, it's a privilege to be with you all here today. I'm not the first senior official uh, of the RBA to address this event. But to put it mildly, our central banking predecessors 100 years ago would have been surprised to see us here. The high priest of central banking in the mid-1920s was someone called Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England. And Norman was a pretty strange character. He was a devotee of mysticism. He wore a long, flowing cloak. And wherever he went, he traveled under a fake name of Professor Clarence Skinner. His communication strategy was succinctly summarized in the pithy phrase, never explain, never apologize. He regularly put those uh, words into practice. When asked by a parliamentary select committee in 1930 to rationalize a particular course of action that he'd taken, he simply tapped the side of his nose three times and stared into the distance. Uh, despite, or perhaps because of this unusual behavior, journalists loved him. A breathless 1932 New York Times pen portrait was entitled Banker and Legend. It purred, Mr. Norman is all elusiveness, technique, finesse. He sits silent, discreet, unseen, exercising a power unthought of by old-fashioned tyrants and only glimpsed by alchemists of long ago poring over their crucibles. Sadly, that passion went unreciprocated. Indeed, Norman made titanic efforts to avoid the press at all costs. Once, when he was aboard a ship in rough seas, word reached him that reporters were gathering to question him at the next port, and he leapt over the side of the boat, shimmied down a rope ladder, and made his escape on a dinghy. Never explain, never apologize permeated every aspect of the Bank of England's operations at that time, not for them, the modern paraphernalia of glossy reports, explainers, and press conferences. For much of the 20th century, changes in official interest rates were communicated solely through the medium of a large printed card put in the bank's ornate lobby and a simultaneous verbal announcement by someone called the government broker to traders in the government bond market. To effect that announcement, the broker removed his top hat, because of course he had to wear a top hat, stood upon a bench, and bellowed at the top of his voice, Fleet Street's finest played no role whatsoever. Even when I joined the Bank of England in the early 1990s, the main job at the head of the press office was still said to be with no real irony to keep the bank out of the press and the press out of the bank. That mindset extended well beyond the United Kingdom. The US Federal Reserve, for example, was established in conditions of such extreme secrecy that those meetings to agree its charter in 1910 tried to pass off their discussions as a recreational duck hunting trip. Three quarters of a century later, they were still at it. In 1987, Alan Greenspan famously told members of the US Congress, since I've become a central banker, I've learned to mumble with great incoherence. <laughs> if I seem unduly clear to you, you must have misunderstood what it was that I was saying. He was only half joking. Over recent years, however, things have changed profoundly as central banks have emerged blinking into the sunlight of greater transparency, a process dubbed the Quiet Revolution by Alan Blinder. The revolution certainly began quite quietly. The RBA, for example, only began announcing changes to its policy rate to the media in 1990. Prior to that, market participants were expecting to draw their own conclusions about what had happened by scrutinizing the detail of the bank's arcane market operations. In the years since, however, the revolution has got louder. Central banks now produce a vast stream of material from written inflation reports, research material, policy committee minutes, increasingly interactive public appearances, including speeches, parliamentary scrutiny, conference panels, on the record interviews, and press conferences. And all of that reflects two main things. The first is the recognition that the huge powers conferred on central banks by the granting of operational independence, powers that affect every citizen in the country, come with an essential quid pro quo. And that is the obligation to account for our actions, to explain, to be scrutinized, and to be challenged. That need for explicit public accountability 
has been further amplified by the burgeoning scale, scope and complexity of central bank operations, by back-to-back -back crises and by the more demanding public expectations of public institutions generally. But transparency and challenge isn't something we have to do. It also drives clearly better policy making. Public understanding and trust in our mission helps to anchor inflation expectations, which is a vital component of effective monetary policy. Knowing how central banks see the economic outlook, how policy will respond to changes in that outlook, our so-called reaction functions, affects behavior today. Indeed, for many economies, the vast majority of the effect of monetary policy comes not from changes in interest rates today, but through expectations about how those rates will evolve in the future. So communications is actually everything, or almost everything. But those benefits only accrue if we get our message across, and not just to the modern descendants of those top-hatted bankers, but to the public at large. And that's where we need all of you in this room and the journalistic community. Because let's face it, central bankers globally have a pretty mixed track record historically when it comes to clear and effective communications. Back in 2017, Andy Haldane, who was then chief economist of the Bank of England, estimated the minimum reading age required for a range of public communications, including central bank publications, The Economist, Elvis Presley's lyrics, and of Donald Trump's speeches. He found that Trump's speeches could be understood by three quarters of the population. Elvis's lyrics by only slightly less, but the complexity of most central banking communications at that time meant they could reach at most only 10% of the public. And that's no basis for building broad-based trust, credibility, and understanding. It was clear that we could do better, and we are. Research from the European Central Bank shows that its current president, Christine Lagarde, uses language that is far more widely comprehensible than her predecessors on Andy Haldane's measures. Similarly, the approach adopted by our own governor, Michelle Bullock, at the RBA's new press conferences has won widespread praise for its clarity and simplicity, as we were hearing a minute ago. But the fact is that most people still hear about us through you. Despite the increasingly fractured landscape of social media, on-demand streaming, overwhelmingly the dominant source of information about central bank policy, that is sadly if people look at all, remains the good old press, TV, and radio. So we need your skills as translators and explainers. But we also need your challenge. As public officials, knowing your analysis has to withstand public scrutiny drives an enormous lift in the quality and robustness of that analysis. I saw that close up at the Bank of England in the 1990s when we first embraced real transparency. Poor arguments, which once went unquestioned, frankly, in grey, smoke-filled rooms, did not survive the rigour of public communication. So whatever may have been alleged in some quarters, both I and the RBA strongly welcome challenge, we welcome scrutiny, and we welcome debate. Of course, it's sometimes less fun when robust press scrutiny bleeds over from the purely technocratic to the personal. And that's certainly familiar to someone like me, who comes from a country whose press managed to summarize a particularly salacious episode in the central bank's life as it's the bonk of England, <laughs> filmed a live runoff between a recent prime minister and a decaying lettuce, and followed the Bank of England governor to the office every day for a week during COVID in a frankly somewhat confused attack on the bank's policy on working from home. Some past RBA governors have had to face similar treatment. But all of us in public life must and do recognize the privilege that comes with our roles and the accountability we owe via you to the public at large. So I want to thank you, not just for the vital role you play in helping to explain the inevitable complexities of economic policy, but also for your informed scrutiny and challenge, which forces us to raise our game and stay accountable for the huge powers that we wield. If the cleansing effect of transparency is to continue to be effective, so much your role. Thank you. I've welcomed scrutiny, and now I'm really going to get scrutinized. I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> What's
It's a collective noun for a room full of uh, investigative journalists. That's a, that's a question to the room. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much for coming. You've been here for less than a year and you've caused quite a stir among some commentators, labelling those who claim unwarranted certainty about economic outcomes, false prophets, charlatans and buffoons. How accurately did you predict the negative reaction you got? Well, thank you for that question, Adele. Uh, <laughs> normally a low ball one to start with, but that, you, you went straight for the high ground. I suppose it will be downhill from there. Um, um, the, the point of actually that particular quote that you made, the point of the speech was actually a speech about the importance of public humi humility for public officials. Um, to be clear about what we don't know, because it's a great deal, uh, and to be clear that we're all learning, you know, frankly, together. Um, in that context, um, you know, being uh, uh, you, you saying you are 100% sure about something, which central banks themselves have often done in the past with their, you know, lines, inflation will in the next year be 2.157%. Well, you know with 100% certainty that that forecast is wrong. Uh, you, you need to embrace and understand the elements of uncertainty be, to be effective uh, policy makers. And um, the particular quote you made was actually an attempt to try and suggest that actually quite a lot uh, of that public commentary was framed around one group of people saying the other group of people were buffoons, not me saying that anyone was a buffoon. That was definitely not the uh, uh, point. But I, I, I've actually been uh, quite pleased, I think, that over time people have, um, people have come up to me and said, look, do you know what? And um, the things you were saying in that in that speech were important. I got stopped in the street one day, and uh, you know, being from London, I thought, okay, here it goes. I'm about to get mugged or something. Uh, and a bloke reached out to me, and he, he said, "Look, I want to shake you by the hand." He said, "Look, you know, thank you for coming. Thank you for saying those things." And that does make quite a big difference. So um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll 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 make sure I get the uh, the what's it called? Don't bury the lead. Is that the right phrase? I'll make yeah. sure I don't bury the lead in future. Yeah, actually. Um but there were some nasty comments made to you, like the former Labor senator, Stephen Conroy. This new bloke, Andrew Hauser, he's been to Oxford, but you know, the recent independent report into the RBA found they were insular, arrogant and overconfident. This bloke needs to buy a mirror because he is a complete wanker. <laughs> what do you say to your detractors? I was going to come to this event with a, a baseball cap, actually, with a big W on it. And <laughs> I thought that if you asked me why there's a W, I'd say, well, it's for the walk biz, of course. And uh, <laughs> now I realise, Adele, maybe I should have actually followed through on that. I was too mean to buy the, uh, I, I was too mean to buy the hat. Listen, a serious point, and I made it in the speech. Um, people in public life have to accept uh, that they are subject to scrutiny. Uh, we have to stick uh, to what we've been asked to do by the public. It's a hugely important role. And if occasionally you have to roll with the punches, you have to roll with the punches. Why can't central banks make predictions about interest rates and where, where they will be in the future? It's, so it's important that central banks make predictions about the economy, about inflation, output, employment, consumption, exports. You know, I could list... Uh, I could list a, a lot of them because that forecast is an essential input to policy making. The different thing about interest rates is it's not something you're forecasting from out there. You're trying to forecast your own actions. And central banks have explored this. Some central banks, the New Zealand is one, uh, the Riks Bank is another, actually do publish um, a, a line uh, which they say is their best guess of where interest rates are going uh, to go. Uh, that might seem quite nice when you first put it out. Um, oh, well, now I know where interest rates are going to go. But obviously what you discover over time as the economy evolves is that that forecast for interest rates proves, you know, about as uncertain as anything else. And the risk is that people lose sight of the fact that those forecasts are conditional on everything else going on. And, and what actually somebody did a piece of research looking at one of the central bank's projections of its own uh, interest rates. And when it was first pub published, the financial markets placed almost 100% weight on the forecast. Over time, as that forecast clearly became, you know, as people realized, well, hang on a minute, they haven't got any special insight into where interest rates are going, 
the weight that financial markets placed on that projection of interest rates from the uh, central bank went down and down until it hit roughly zero. I think the important thing for central banks is to explain how we see the economy, how we see the outlook, and how we might respond if different things occurred. And I think one of the most interesting things I've seen uh, there's some press stories around that sort of say, well, you know, the market's not taking the RBA very seriously. I actually would say the exact opposite. When you see pieces of data coming out at the moment on the unemployment or the labor market or inflation or wage growth, you see interest rates in the market, private sector interest rates, adjusting uh, in ways that broadly suggest that those trading in the markets actually do understand pretty clearly what our objective is and what our goals are. That thing which in the trade is called the re and a reaction function, the reaction to data as it comes out is, I would argue, far more useful than saying, do you know what, in a year's time, interest rates will be X, Y, or Z. Because I would tell you the one thing that if anyone tells you that, you should say is, I don't believe you. Yeah, so in other words, it's dangerous. I, I refer you to my previous question, my answer. <laughs> 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 I think you might be a professional at this, I don't <laughs> As you know, the cost of living is probably the number one issue for many Australians. What do you say to people struggling to make ends meet in the face of stubbornly high prices and high interest rates? Well, th this is terrifically important. And this is, I think, why you ask central banks like the RBA to do this job um, at all. And why, despite the difficulties that we know come from higher interest rates, we have to hold, we have to hold our courts. Um, Michelle Bullock did a speech about this uh, about a month ago or so, where she talked at some length about the evidence, both you know, formal evidence and also empirical evidence, uh, of the costs that inflation pose. They hit hardest on people on low incomes, on fixed incomes, often older people, people trying to get onto the housing ladder, um, people on welfare benefits. Um, and it is poisonous because it gets into absolutely every economic decision. I mean, it's not overstating things to say that for countries who've lost control of inflation more severely than they've happened in the past, you quite often get wars or you get civil unrest that come from that because it is deeply unfair. And so what I say to those people, and we do um, get around the country and, and speak to uh, groups working with people who are struggling, uh, that that is why we must stay uh, resilient on fighting inflation. Um, I think occasionally, if I'm honest with you, that point sometimes gets quite lost when people talk about, you know, interest rates coming down prematurely. Um, it's because we understand how painful high inflation and high price levels can be that we are taking the steps we're taking. So inflation is getting stickier. What impact do you think our economy was so many oligopolies in sectors such as supermarkets, energy, airlines, general insurance, have on the stickiness of inflation? You know, I, I, I am going to be careful here because I, I know there are a number of uh, official inquiries into these questions and, and I'm not going to be able to add a great deal uh, of, 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 of light, frankly, uh, to that expert uh, debate. Um, there are a great deal of things that affect inflation. Uh, when you look at the big trends in inflation over the past two to three years, the reason why it went into double digit in the UK, for example, uh, and as you say, has proved uh, slow to fall, um, the big trends in, in the path of inflation that have caused the, the misery and discomfort that you describe have been global in nature. Um, and I think I'll stop there, but it's just to say that I think you know, most central banks around the world with different industrial structures uh, and different approaches domestically to setting prices have faced the enormous challenges that Australia have faced in the last few years. Sure, but I think oligopolies do play a role. But anyway. That um, was a statement. <laughs> <laughs> do you accept that notwithstanding the growth figures, without the government propping up spending, Australia would be in a recession? Um, so there are a lot of drivers of uh, output and demand growth in the economy. Uh, we try to decompose them. Uh, uh, we do our best, but there are a number of different ways uh, of telling the story. I think, to be frank, uh, and I've come from an economy in the UK 
you know, where the debt stock is over 100% of GDP, uh, where the government deficit is, is very large as a share uh, of, of GDP. Uh, to be honest, um, there are bigger issues uh, in the Australian economy uh, at the moment uh, in terms of driving the outlook for inflation, what's happening or will happen in China, what's happening in the housing market, where the consumption growth will pick up again in the middle of this year, as, as we and others expect it to do, with a, a what's driving the extraordinary growth uh, in employment uh, and jobs uh, in the economy. Um, you know, uh, I was taught years ago uh, in terms of the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, you know, you've got a different, difficult enough job uh, trying to tackle inflation. Uh, uh, stick to your knitting, stay in your lane. I'm going to stay in my lane. So you're not, you're not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Given the recent rate cuts in the UK and the US, how do you view Australia's position in the global economic landscape? And why do you think we're lagging? On interest rates? Yeah. Um, so Australia is obviously an open economy. It, its wealth, which is considerable, has been built up over you know, decades of successfully trading in that global economy, obviously at one time, his trading relationship was primarily with the UK, then it switched uh, over time uh, towards Asia, and that's been a very uh, a source of great growth and, and prosperity for the country over time. What happens in the global economy matters for the Australian uh, economy. What um, is not the case is that we have to sort of look at what other central banks are doing with interest rates and say, well, look, we must move in lockstep. Our exchange rate is floating. We must set uh, interest rates in the economy uh, for Australian inflation uh, and not for American inflation or UK inflation or, or German inflation. Uh, and at the moment, whereas inflation in the US uh, has fallen back you know, close to target, um, it has not done so uh, in Australia. And what's well, quite interesting, actually, I was at Jackson Hole, the, the sort of summer retreat that the Federal Reserve do a few weeks ago in Wyoming, and heard Jay Powell's speech where he said, look, the time has come. Essentially, he didn't put it in words, but he meant this. The time has come to start uh, cutting interest rates. And he said, look, the reason for that is that we are confident that inflation is now sustainably coming back towards target. Um, we are still waiting for the outlook for underlying inflation to come sustainably back to target. We're applying the same tests uh, that the Federal Reserve and other central banks are doing. Uh, but inflation in Australia, for various reasons, is stickier uh, than it has been overseas, and you know, as soon as it stops being sticky, uh, we'll react. So partly oligopolies. <laughs> um, in in terms of the Australian economy, what issues overseas concern you the most? Like Ukraine, China, yeah. the Middle East. Um, it's funny, isn't it? Because often when people talk about the global economy, it's framed in terms of risks, and you, you've just done it now. And I, and I, and, I, and I think um, it's right to start there. Um, our biggest single trading partner is obviously China, so the prospects uh, for the outlook for China are crucial uh, to uh, our prospects. Um, China's been going through some struggles recently, as, as you well know, and the room knows. Um, you know it's based, it, it, it starts in their property sector, commercial property sector, residential property, uh, but it goes deeper than that. Um, their enormous growth rates have driven our growth in the last few years, uh, and so our interests are very heavily tied in uh, with the prospects in China, not just in terms of whether they get on top of uh, the, the, their economy, and obviously they recently announced a very large uh, stimulus package, but also the uncertainties and question marks that will obviously arise about future trading relationships, uh, depending on the outcome of elections in the US and, and more generally in the next uh, few years. So I could actually stop there, because I think that is disproportionately uh, a big question mark for us, but I won't, I won't stop there, I'll, I'll, I'll go on. It's good news for us, uh, and as I say, this may be less of a risk than an opportunity that the US continues to grow as rapidly as it has been. It's amazing, actually, how quickly uh, the US has been creating jobs uh, and, uh, and generating output, and um, you know, all to the good. But I think more than anything, the, the weakness in productivity growth that we've been seeing is something that you have seen globally, and it requires a global solution. Sorry, I've, I've rambled a bit there at the end. Um, the risk you mentioned, the Middle East, uh, the potential fracturing of, of trade relationships. Uh, and, and oil and prices. And oil prices, you could like run the list, are considerable. And they matter to us because we're an open economy. 
The RBA review says the bank should take account of climate change risks, but not use monetary policy to address them. How do you see this working? Um, so I uh, spent uh, obviously most of my career at the Bank of England and, and, and for a period under Mark Carney, uh, who was obviously a Canadian uh, governor and, and ran the Bank of England. And he uh, positioned the Bank of England at the forefront of the debate about central banking uh, and climate risk. Um, we took a number of initiatives in that, in, in, at, that, at that time uh, to, uh, to, to take account of, of um, climate risk and central banking, starting with stress testing uh, of the banking system, stranded assets, the outlook for uh, residential home loans, uh, the difficulties that that could be challenged by you know, building houses in floodplains or whatever it might be, uh, what would different transition risk paths look like for the central bank and for the banking system? That's core to central banking uh, in, in the UK. Here, obviously, that falls to APRA. On the monetary policy side, you know, big questions about whether we're going to have a sequence of supply shocks pushing inflation up in the future uh, that we'll need to take account of in our interest rate policy. I think the area that is more open to debate uh, is uh, whether the uh, central bank should be at the forefront of making the case uh, for, um, uh, for tackling uh, climate change. Uh, uh, we did so for a period in the UK that uh, may have moved the debate forward. It also drew the central bank from time to time into the political sphere in ways that you know, needed handling. And I think right now what I would say uh, for the RBA and for Australia is that we obviously need to take account uh, of, of uh, climate risk for uh, our, our day job, uh, but that our day job, as you've been saying in your previous questions, uh, you can see we can get an oligopoly reference in, um, uh, uh, but our day job of bringing inflation down is not done. Uh, and, you know, we have to, and I want to, you know, we double, double down on our commitment, we have to take that seriously. Uh, it's a big job, uh, and we're not done yet. Uh, perhaps, you know, when you've achieved your job, you can be given other things to do, but right now, we've got that job to do. So what's your view of the establishment of a monetary policy board and why would it be better? So this was a recommendation of the review and it, it seems uh, like a good idea. It was, recommend it was adopted by the government, uh, but I am conscious that that proposal is, is being subject to ongoing uh, political debate in Canberra and it is a political decision because in the end of the day, central banks are political creations uh, society, the public choose to delegate a really important job uh, to a bunch of unelected officials like me, in some cases foreigners, in some cases described in robust terms by uh, <laughs> ex-politicians, and we have to take seriously the responsibility that comes with it. So if those arrangements are changed uh, or need to be changed, it should and rightly should be uh, for politicians to decide. So although, um, although those proposals, in my view, uh, are a good idea, um, the vast majority uh, of the RBA review uh, uh, consisted of things that doesn't require legislation or, or agreement in Canberra. It requires changes uh, to be made by us, and as was mentioned earlier, we're getting on with that. Uh, something like 40 out of the 50-plus recommendations are things that we can just do, and that's what we're doing. So how critical is it for it to get through part of the, the whole changing look of the Reserve Bank? How critical is the, the board part of yeah. it to get through? I mean, it's a part of it, it's a part of it, but the review uh, as a whole was recommending for the RBA to become more open, uh, to increase the uh, um, uh, professionalism and uh, uh, debate uh, and diversity in its uh, policy discussions. Uh, and, you know, we're doing that, and we'll work with the structures that we're given by government. Um, I, I am conscious, you know, if you sort of say, well, look, come on, just get on with it, um, that puts us in the middle of a, a political debate, and, and it rightly is a political debate, so I think we'll leave that to politicians. So, I've got one more question, but I'm Is it about oligopolies? No, it's not. <laughs> I can slip another one in, though. Um, but I'm going to open it up to the floor, and then I'll try and squeeze my last question in. Thanks, Adele. Thanks, Andrew. So, Margie here is going to be a microphone person. Oh, yeah. So, oh, that was sneaky. <laughs> okay, so um, if you um, head off with your questioning now, um, I'll leave this to Adele um, and I'll leave it to you when we need uh, uh, Deputy Governor, I appreciate your comments. Um, 
Uh, I had a question uh, well, uh, relates to your speech uh, largely, but um, you may have seen in our paper, we've written quite a few articles about the RBA's private briefings. I wondered if you had any thoughts on that uh, and whether the RBA was considering a change of policy or re was reviewing the way they do things. Thank you. Uh, some of you know David Bolden. Before we uh, came in, I said, David, will this be a nice cosy lunch? And he said, uh, yeah, I wouldn't bet on it really. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, look, um, obviously I come from the Bank of England. Most of my career has been spent there. I know from my own experience that when crisis hits, you need good relationships across the economy. Um, you need to under, no, you, 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 need, you need good links with industry, you need good links with unions, you need good links with public organizations, and you do need good links with the financial sector as well. You need to understand how they think, you need to understand how their business is going, and without that, you do a bad job. And it is, you know, obviously the case that the RBA review that we were just talking about had recommended that, if anything, the uh, RBA gets out more, frankly. Um, and, you know, I've been going around talking to people in Australia, and some of them have very good relationships with the RBA, and some of them have said to me, do you know what, we could afford to see the RBA occasionally more. We'd like, we've got things to tell them, uh, and we'd like to feel listened to. So we do a great deal uh, in that area, and for me, the number one point is that whatever arrangements uh, are in place, that that essential fact-gathering exercise is, is, is at least as high a priority as it has been here in the past, if not higher um, still. That's sort of point one. I think point two is, uh, uh, sometimes people say, you know, Law, you must be great being a central banker, you've got all these secrets. The truth is, the, the dirty secret about central banking is there aren't many secrets. Uh, the biggest secret is obviously the interest rate decision. Uh, that's discussed in the board and it's put out almost straight, straight away afterwards uh, in the uh, public statement. Uh, and from there on in, you're basically discussing material that's in the public domain. Uh, so, you know, whilst I, I know sometimes people, including in the financial market, clamour to come to these round tables, you know, in the hope they might hear something that's, you know, not in the public domain, they don't. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's, and, 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 you know, perhaps they go away disappointed. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, so number one, um, uh, you know, it's important for us to listen. Uh, number two, there really isn't any private information to give. And number three, I would say, from, from a central banking part, perspective, you have to go into those meetings conscious that they're basically you know, sales events. They're basically uh, the sell side of the financial system saying, look, here are all my clients. You know, I can deliver to you uh, a senior official uh, and uh, come, and hear what they, uh, come and hear what they have to say and maybe ask them uh, a, few, a few questions. So you have to go in. Uh, savvy. Um, we're aware of the debate. We're aware of what's been said uh, in, in recent days uh, and recent weeks. Um, but those are the principles that we're operating under. Uh, and, you know, we continue to reflect. Thank you, Deputy Governor, for and, and the lovely conversation. Narell Hooper. Uh, I was fascinated by the insights on communication styles. Um, and given that RBA is about 10, getting through to about 10% of the population. Uh, Donald Trump's the aspirational 70. I didn't say the RBA. I think it was actually the FOM. <laughs> or the, the central, US. the central bank. Central banks in general. Um, a few years ago as well. How would well 2017? <laughs> uh, if you um, how, in order to get through to that level of the community, how would you frame the current? economic situation and, and, the, and the bank's stance. Oh, no, you, so you're asking me actually yeah. to... Fr oh, my gosh, this is a... You can do worse it. Worse than yours. <laughs> um, we understand that inflation is too high. We understand that inflation is harming uh, your family uh, and your um, uh, business, if you own a business, uh, and your way of life, and we're determined to bring it down. That's why interest rates are at the level they're at. Uh, we're monitoring the outlook closely, uh, but you can trust us that we will do what it takes to bring inflation down. Uh, Andrew, Don't ask me that again. I, that was winging it, I can tell you. <laughs> Andrew, Shane Wright from the SMH and the A. Hi, uh, Shane. I just want to go back to the, your speech. Um, and Montague would have really struggled, uh, Greenspan would have really struggled with where communications are for the bank. You've touched on it as, as an unelected official but the importance of what the bank does in setting interest rates, it affects people's employment, it affects their wages, it affects the small business, it affects the large business. 
so much power has been delivered by democratically elected government to central banks since the mid-90s. You've seen Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, you've seen Trump, you've seen plenty of Labor MPs express displeasure about where the bank is going or making their decisions. Do you think ultimately there will be a, there's a tension between the democracy encapsulated in the parliament and also the unelected officials who are, have so much economic power over the lives of so many people? This is a tremendously important question and probably deserves a conference rather than a two-minute uh, answer. I would start by making the point that independence for central banks is a political decision. Uh, uh, governments, the public, uh, can give central banks independence and they can take it away. Uh, when you look at the long history uh, of central banking, you know, the, the vast majority of its time, and it goes back centuries, you, know, you haven't had anything approaching uh, the kind of independence uh, that's been granted since the 1990s. Um, I think you can probably argue that the economic benefits of granting that independence across countries has been positive and has br held, uh, until recently anyway, has held inflation low uh, and allowed economies to grow and, 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 uh, and employment to grow in ways uh, that have been beneficial to, to millions, if not billions, uh, of people. But, but you have to be, as a central banker, conscious of the conditionality of the job that you've been given. Um, in the UK, it is granted through legislation. Uh, Parliament can upturn that legislation. Uh, in RBA, in, in, in Australia, it's slightly different in the sense there is primary legislation and then there's also the statement on the conduct of monetary policy uh, that defines more, more specifically uh, what the regime is that we, uh, uh, that we work under. Obviously, the public policy case for delegating authority to the central bank is that other efforts over time uh, to hold inflation low proved to be less effective. Um, in particular, there was an impetus, uh, and, 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 and people recognize this, there was an impetus uh, to inflate the economy at certain, in certain periods when, in fact, it would be better to deflate it. That tension that there will be a sense of, oh, if only we could you know, ease policy a little bit now, wouldn't everyone be better off uh, in the short term? which would be damaging in the medium and longer term, is exactly the reason why people argue that independence uh, is a good thing. But I think you only have independence if you are accountable to parliament, to the public through you, to parliament through the parliamentary scrutiny, uh, and through our performance. And look, I'll be honest with you, the last few years for central banks have been periods in which that performance has been questioned, right? Um, the drivers of inflation, uh, have by and large been things, uh, I would argue, that have been beyond uh, central banks' control. Uh, the um, Obviously, COVID. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the crisis that followed the Ukraine, uh, uh, and more recently, other drivers. But you're entitled to question and challenge that, and Shane, you often do, and, and, and long may you continue to do that. Uh, and the important question is to central banks, are you doing the job we delegated to you because we thought it was in our interest as well as you possibly can? Uh, and when the answer to that is, frankly, no, then I would expect that that mandate for central banks will be withdrawn. So far, I hope central banks have proved, after perhaps a shaky year or two, uh, that inflation globally is coming down. It's coming down in Australia. It's not coming down as fast as we would like, but it is coming down. Uh, and most importantly of all, you know, employment continues to grow, which is in our, our remit. Uh, that you and everyone in this room and everyone beyond this room will continue to give us, you know, this vital role. Uh, but it is conditional, uh, and, you know, if at some future point the public viewers who want to take it away with all the consequences that that might have, uh, then I'm sure that will be a debate to be had. Thank you very much for your address. Kirsten Aiken from the ABC. The Governor has continued to emphasise that the board is very much data dependent, looking backwards to confirm what is happening in the economy. Given the widening war in the Middle East, will the RBA board now have to look forwards also to take into account possible disruptions to oil supply and upward pressure on the price, on inflation? This is an important question. Uh, to state the obvious, and a room full of journalists, I mean, it, the Middle East has been unsettled for some time now. And actually, 
through that period, the oil price has been flat to falling slightly. The um, analytical basis for that is that, by and large, the countries that are the marginal providers of oil have not been caught up in this conflict. Um, uh, the US has obviously become much more self-sufficient in oil over that period. Saudi Arabia has kept the taps on, et cetera, et cetera. And so, although if I probably ask most people in this room, and perhaps even me, to draw what you thought the oil price might have done over the past two years freehand, you've probably drawn the line going up. In fact, it's been flat to slightly falling. Um, it's picked up a little bit in the last day or two as, as some of the question marks over the outlook in the region have, have increased. But it's still materially below where it got after the Ukraine uh, invasion. Um, and so we have to watch it closely. I think, I guess, sorry, long-winded answer short, to, to shorten it. Um, we, we're keeping a close eye on that, as we do on many risks. So far, I wouldn't put it top three. Could the RBA hold off on a rate cut because of the risk to supply? If it did look like, for instance, Israel was going to lodge a fairly large-scale attack against Iran and key infrastructure? We only make decisions on interest rates based on our outlook for inflation and employment as a whole. So we'd put it into, the, if, if the scenario you describe occurred and, you know, oil prices began to rise sharply, that would be a factor in our outlook for inflation. Um, obviously, to some extent, if you had a pickup in oil prices, you might expect that activity and output in the indus industrial sector would fall. So it might have negative implications for some other drivers of inflation. So whether or not that would be a one-for-one -one increase in inflation or have some offsets, you know, would take some time uh, and effort to analyze. You would never base your interest rate decision on one single factor, uh, whether it's that or oligopolies or anything else. Um, you put it in the mixer uh, and you make an overall evaluation. Andrew, Edward Boyd at Sky News. Uh, the past couple of press conferences, Governor Bullock has basically said, we are not cutting interest rates at all this year. You can forget about it. Uh, is, that is, that, is that a verbatim quote? <laughs> it's, it's not a verbatim quote, but it is the general vibe <laughs> if you watch the whole 45 minutes that she normally speaks. Um, but is that getting dangerously close to providing forward guidance, something you promised you wouldn't ever do again? And I note in the minutes today, you've kind of become a little bit more dovish as well. Wow, um, where should I start on that? Um, uh, the, the, the kind of forward guidance, uh, and we were talking about earlier with, with Adele, that, that all central banks have to do is they have to talk about how they would react depending on how the future economy evolves. And, you know, um, uh, I, I was just leaving the Bank of England when Ben Bernanke, who used to run the Federal Reserve, was doing a review of its forecasts and performance during the last few years, and one of his recommendations was that actually the Bank of England, and I think by implication other central banks too, could usefully start talking more about what you might call those if-then statements. So if X happens, our, our view about policy would be, you know, Y. And, and what the minutes that you describe, you know, that came out this morning attempt to do is to make a start on that, on that journey. Um, I, I, I don't know whether I describe, you know, we remain vigilant to upside risks to inflation, uh, as being a particularly dovish message, but you're the journalist, not me. Um, uh, you know, uh, as the minutes say, I think actually on the month since the last meeting, the board's view was that there wasn't actually very much news uh, in, the, uh, in the data. So I think, look, we will continue to describe how we see the outlook for the economy and we'll continue to describe how we expect we might react to that outlook. And I think that's what, frankly, Michelle was doing uh, in, the, uh, in the press conference when someone put to her, well, look, you know, not sure the market's taking it very seriously because the rate interest rate, future interest rate curve is falling. Uh, and she described how the board saw the outlook. Hi, Andrew Lucas from the Fin Review. I just wanted to pick up on a point from Johnny's question, these private briefings that the RBA does. If they're effectively sales exercises for other banks, you can't say anything that's not already public and two banks have already broken the trust of that private briefing exercise. What, what's really the point of doing these private briefings? There's one big point, uh, and it's really incumbent on all of us as public officials uh, uh, to make sure that those meetings focus on it, and that is to hear what is going on in the wider markets. 
And I just come back to the point that the review stressed that the RBA needed to get out of the building to listen more and to understand how the economy and the financial system was evolving. And it's that part of the process, the listening part of the process, uh, that is important. Uh, I've spent a considerable amount of my time, because I'm new here in Australia, trying to travel around the country rather than hang around in the sort of 200 square feet of, of, of Sydney CBD um, to hear uh, the different elements of the wider real economy, the mining sector in, down in Adelaide in Townsville, traveling right around the country to talk to businesses. Now, of course, they want to hear your perspective on policy. But the thing that I find interesting and actually one of the most, you know, frankly inspiring and, and energizing parts of my job is to hear people, uh, is to hear people, how people's businesses, how their family affairs, how their ec finances are evolving. Uh, and it's that listening part of the process that it's vital we do. Uh, we, do we must do it on appropriate ground rules, but it's vital that we do it in order to set policy and respond to the kind of challenges that you've been making in this, uh, at this lunch. I mean, how good is the RBA at listening then, and how has that evolved? Like, when you came in, were they good at listening? I don't know, because I wasn't here, but I know what good listening looks like, uh, and I intend to do it myself, and I know my colleagues do too. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia Brace from Seven News. Two more very quickly, just following up on the briefings. If they are more about listening, should we change what they're called? Would that ease the confusion? Uh, and quick follow-up from my colleagues in Canberra, noting that you said you didn't want to forecast. Could you predict or speculate whether we should still not expect an interest rate cut this year? <laughs> well, it's, can't, exactly, I can't can't criticise them for trying. Um, I don't know what, the, on the first point, I don't know what they call, to be honest. The, 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 the biggest single effort that the RBA makes, uh, which is on the real economy side, is called the liaison team. Uh, and I think liaison is quite a good word, to be honest. It, it, it does involve a, uh, the idea of a two-way exercise. Uh, you know, yes, we tell economies how we see the economy. Uh, you know, in, in part, it's, you know, the rather awkward question about can you summarise, you know, the outlook of the economy? I mean, you know, being able to translate our view of the outlook for the economy for, for businesses up and down the country, many of whom, frankly, don't have the time to read all of our, you know, complex uh, output, uh, is part of what the service would provide. That's the transmit bit. Um, the listening bit uh, is the other half of liaison, so maybe we should call it liaison. I, I don't know whether they call briefings or, or kind of not. Um, on, the, on the outlook for int interest rates, I mean, I, the only thing I'd say, I'd say about, you know, to be honest, if I told you where interest rates were going, your, your, the right response from you would be, yeah, whatever. I mean, I don't know. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of data that's going to come out between now and the next meeting and the meeting after that, and we'll sit around in the boardroom and we'll discuss it. And, you know, where interest rates will go either in that meeting or in the subsequent meeting, it's not like I've got it in my head and I just won't tell you now. I genuinely don't know. And so your... Op rational response, if I said to you that interest rates were going to X, Y, and Z, I nearly gave a number then, I realised that would have been a mistake. Um, <laughs> um, uh, well, well, exactly, it would be great for you, uh, uh, even greater for your contact from Canberra. But, um, but your rational response would be like, well, okay, fine. Some guys said they'd be X percent, um, but I don't know. And, and actually, I would encourage everyone uh, to have that att attitude of kind of, you know, uh, sceptical scrutiny of what people tell you when they claim to know where interest rates are going because they don't. Thank you. So my last question was actually about the briefings. Uh, this is an on-the-record briefing, which is very different to what the Financial Review has been talking about, which is off-the-record briefings. And I quote from the Fin, where it's saying, the Fed in the US has rules that say it would not be appropriate to hold a private meeting with selected clients of a profit-making entity to discuss monetary policy. So it's, it's really, it's just not a good look. Um, so, and, and what, what's your opinion of it? Do you think that they should be like this one on the record rather than off the record? Great. I, I can assure you the, the, um, the dry nature of much of our liaison over time, I think if we put it on the video, people would probably say, dear God, can you please stop. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of hours of it every 
uh, every um, every every month. Um, let me start on the you know the real economy side of it, and and we meet you know hundreds if not thousands of companies every year. We do that privately, um, and we 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 do that so that they can tell us how their individual business is doing, uh, how their pricing decisions are evolving, how their employment decisions are evolving. They often give us information that in their industry and for that company would be highly commercially sensitive. We don't obviously have any particular interest in that commercial sensitivity. What we do have an interest in is building up from that picture of individual corporate feedback, uh, a picture of the economy that is timely, that is well informed, that it has a good regional basis to it, uh, and which is, you know, also based on one-to-one -one contact, where we can ask the question why. And aggregate economic data do not answer the question why; they just tell you the number. Um, I, I am pretty confident that on that real economy side, if we said to them, "Well, look, sorry, mate, but we're going to have to, you know." throw as much light on those private conversations as this. They come with a speech, they read it out, we'd learn nothing, and the society would be less well off as a result. So that in, in that context, I understand that's not directly the question you're asking, but I, do, I don't think I want to make that clear that actually in order to have a rich and deep contact base, which helps all of you and the wider economy in the room, it is important that we treat the information they give us about their individual business confidentially, whilst using the aggregate picture that we derive out of adding it up to inform monetary policy. And for what it's worth, we don't tell the board members, you know, that com company A or company B has said this, because obviously that could itself be uh, something that would be uh, breaking a confidence. I think I'm only going to repeat what I said earlier to the AFR. We've heard the debate. Uh, we understand uh, I'm used to a different setup. Uh, in the UK, I am relatively, you said I've been here a year, I've been here about six months, so um, less we've... Than a year. <laughs> or less than a year, it's a, it's a lot less than a year. Um, uh, and uh, what, I, uh, what is crucial uh, is that whatever regime we have going forward, it maintains and enhances that flow of information into us because we owe it to you lot to do the best we can at monetary policy. Right, but it, it will have processes in place. There are processes already. I think this is an important point. I mean, I don't want anyone to go away from this thinking, well, gosh, you know, we're just sort of letting it all hang loose. That's not how central bankers operate. There are ground rules, clear statements at the beginning of each, of e of each meeting. Uh, and, and, you know, it process, this system is not light on process. Uh, I, you make uh, an interesting point about cross-country comparisons. Um, but please, you know, don't go away from this thinking this is all being done without process. It's not the case. Thank you.